This is Vin Baker, you watching Real Fans Real Talk. RealFansRealTalk.com Where Arthur Diamond's trip young and intern Tom For the white and black fans, Asia to Manhattan I get all my facts from my bro Mark the Stats Man If you're not tuned in, I recommend the CAT scan Hello everyone, Mark the Statman Skevich, Real Fans Real Talk Alongside four-time NBA All-Star Vin Baker here at the 50th anniversary of Rucker Park they're conducting the skills the skills drills for the youth. And Vin, how important is it for you to be involved here with the kids, helping them learn basketball at such a young age? Well, it's so important. I mean, I, I didn't really have a, any pros come through my uh, neighborhood when I was growing up to talk about the game. You know, it would be irresponsible for us, you know, players who have played the game at a high level not to give back to these young kids. These kids really want to play someday, hopefully in college and, and, and within the NBA. So to have the opportunity to come out here and work with them and show them things that will make them better is, is what it's all about. And now, how young were you personally when you first started falling in love with the sport of basketball? I probably was about nine, eight years old, like a lot of these kids out here. I really fell in love with it. Didn't know what I was going to be, how tall I was going to be. I just loved the competition, loved competing, and loved the skill of the game. So I would just go out and play all I could whenever I had the opportunity. Did you have a favorite player growing up? I did. My favorite player growing up, with, I'm dating myself right now, was Dr. Was Dr. J. That was my, um, that was my favorite player. I, I grew up watching him. The 76ers were my team, and so I really try to emulate. Until I got 6'11", I started to emulate my game after Dr. J. Yourself, you were a little bit of a late bloomer, so to speak, but so was Michael Jordan. Uh, uh, during your early college career and high school, weren't necessarily a superstar. Started blossoming later in the college years. Uh, what, but what's your opinion as far as the league changing the rules of players uh, being drafted out of high school? Well, I understand that physically some of the guys are ready to perform at that level. You know, you got some kids who are just gifted athletically and gifted. And from a skill standpoint, for me, growing up in a smaller town and going to a small college, it allowed me to really work on my skills and really, um, you know, work on my craft at a level where it wasn't as competitive. But um, being able to do a lot of the things I could really helped me for the next level. So, you know, it's great for these kids to go earlier uh, at 19 and 20 and 18. But, you know, one of the things I, I worry about is their maturity in the game. And will, they'll be, will they be able to understand the game and learn on the fly? Because once you get to the NBA, it is about development, but it's also about money and it's also about winning games. It's a little bit different than college and high school. Now, speaking of getting into the NBA, what was that like for you getting drafted in the first round by the Bucks? It was, a, it was an amazing feeling. One of the top five moments of my life is to, um, and I actually didn't know I was going to go to the Bucks, so that even added to it, being in the green room with my mother and my father. And just a dream come true, all the hard work that had paid off and to finally have that moment. It was just the beginning of the dream, though. Now, getting to the NBA, I'm, I'm blossoming early in the NBA career, a four-time NBA All-Star, but what was it like stepping out on the court? I'm sure you were a fan of some of the guys that you're playing against, maybe Michael Jordan, or what was that like being on the court with some of the guys as a teenager that you watched play? Terrifying. Uh, my, my first few times being on the floor with these amazing stars, you know, seeing Michael and seeing Patrick, Carl Malone, I was just in awe. Uh, but I had to get out of all really fast because they were kicking my butt in the first year. But once I got the game down, I, I, and, and being in awe, I also was studying how to get better. And um, so my first experiences were in awe, but, you know, probably eight, nine months into it, I was ready to compete at a high level. Now, you were obviously great, but you weren't necessarily, didn't have the luck of being on a, a or a serious contender. You, you went to the Sonics after they were in the finals. Like, do you, you kind of regret that you never got the chance? We see a lot of times nowadays players like Kevin Love going to contenders and taking a contract uh, break. Do you think, you know, do you regret some of the, that, that you weren't able to play for a contender? Well, my, my first year in Seattle, we were we uh, won 61 games. We were 61 and 21. So we still, you know, we're the number one team in the West. Um, you know, I don't regret, you know, any any things with my career as far as playing on a contender. I thought that team uh, could have definitely contended for a, a championship. We were um, eliminated by the Lakers, who were a very good team at the time as well. Um, but I understand these guys making moves. Um, the wonderful part about the game today as far as making moves contractually and going to winning teams is 
teams are able to fill, fill the contract as well as put together a good team. You know, it, it was a point in the 90s where you only had two players who could make max contracts. Now you have four and five players who are demanding max contracts, and that's where the money is. So you do have an opportunity not only to play and get your max dollar, but also play on a team that's potentially a contender. I think you have about 12 to 15 teams that have a potential, a possibility of winning a championship this year. I mean, we've seen the Knicks uh, as an eight seed make the finals. We've seen other eight seeds make the finals. So as long as you're in the dance, you could definitely make it. Um, now, speaking of the Knicks, you ha had a short tenure with the Knicks, but um, you played high school in Connecticut and college in Connecticut, so it's kind of the local team. So was that, even though it wasn't a, your first team or your last team or the longest team, was the, the Knicks hold a special place in your heart? Oh, absolutely. I have like two or three great moments um, that I had here at the Garden that rank in my top 20 uh, moments in basketball in my life. One of them was playing here at the Garden and getting a standing ovation in the playoffs against the Nets. Uh, coming off the court and getting a standing ovation was one of the top moments of my life in basketball. So New York, will, the Knicks will always have a special place in my heart. It's the mecca of basketball, and like you alluded to and mentioned that I'm from Connecticut, right down the road, so I know all the history of the sport, of the game here in the city and the, and the Knicks, of course, so just being part of this organization has been amazing. It's a blessing to have them have me come back and give back to the city of New York. Now, speaking of history, obviously Rucker Park, huge history, 50 years. Uh, do you have some moments in Rucker Park, some of your favorite moments? or? I think I, I didn't play here, but I think my favorite moment, more of the recent moments, is when Durant came here. And I forgot the amount that he scored, but just to have a player of that magnitude come down here, I think it was in the 60s or 70s or something like that. Um, I think that was my probably most memorable moment and the one I can think of off the top of my head. Now, did you have a favorite team growing up? Was it the Sixers since you like Dr. J, or did you have a different favorite team? Yeah, I, I, I loved uh, the Sixers. Um, I liked watching Magic and the Lakers. I thought they were an exciting brand of basketball in the 80s. So I would say the Sixers and the Lakers were my two teams growing up. I, I wanted them to make the finals each year, So both, but you also know there was that team up north that always disrupted that. You had uh, Detroit and then Chicago pretty much, you know. In Boston at one point. They, Exactly, exactly. Um, so, now going to like the down part of your career, you had the uh, lockout and you were a four time All Star, and then after the lockout, things kind of changed. Um, do you attribute the lockout to any of that or? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think there was a moment in the season in my life where I didn't play well and, you know, things that were going on off the court. Um, but, you know, it's, it's basketball, it's, it's life, and, you know, we bounce back from that. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just grateful and blessed I had the opportunity to play 13 years, you know, play five of them, six of them at a very high level, all NBA, all star, uh, won a gold medal. You know, things happen. If I look back over my life at the age of 43 and ask God would, to give me 13 years of NBA, five of them uh, being an all-star and one being an Olympian, I can't ask for any more. So, um, yeah, there was tumultuous times and some tough times during, during, during my career, but and I look back over it, I'm just grateful and blessed that I had the opportunity. Now, you have the Stan Toll Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I, I no longer have that foundation, but I am still working with the youth in the community, um, giving back in any way I can, in particular helping with these clinics, um, going and speaking at high schools uh, about, you know, basketball, about professional uh, sports and about drugs and about alcohol, just giving back any way I can to the community and giving back to the kids. They indeed are our future. And, you know, I, you know, it'd be irresponsible for us as former athletes not to give back and to let them know the, the highs of the game and also the lows of the game, what to watch out for, what to make them better on each and every occasion. All right, now some of the more recent uh, highlights of your career, you actually uh, laced them up not too long ago. Uh, Dennis Rodman gave you a call to come and play overseas in North Korea. What was that like when you were asked to become a member? Uh, very you know, different. The experience was very different. Um, in hindsight, I don't know if I would have actually gone. I think, you know, if the national publicity it received, I know our intentions of, of uh, you know, 
to bring basketball to different countries was, was the right thing to do. Um, but in hindsight, it was very different. I think it was an experience that we'll grow from and we'll all learn from. I think the, the basketball players that were there in uh, North Korea, of course, appreciated it. And um, we put it behind us and we moved forward. Now, you said the publicity and everything. Was there, uh, it, it was a larger than life type of experience because of the, the worldwide attention that it was getting. Uh, I watched the documentary that Dennis Rodman had and everything, but was there ever a, a, a state of fear or anything like that uh, because of everything that was going on over there? I have to be honest with you, I, I didn't at once have a, felt like I was nervous or felt like I was in a place of danger. You know, I just put my faith and trust in God that he would take us there for what we were there to do and bring us back safely. And I kind of rested on that the entire time. And of course, we made it back safely and um, with no hurt, harm or danger. And we're, we're moving forward. Now, aside from all the political stuff and everything, there was a basketball game played. What was that like? Even though, you know, the, 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 it seemed like you guys underestimated them a little bit, but you did kind of have a, a little bit of a reunion, and a lot of times you played against these guys. Now you're playing with them, a lot of the old-timers. What was that like to step back out on the court with some of the guys you used to play against? Well, we, you, you said it. We definitely underestimated their skill level. You know, we had done a clinic with them earlier in the morning, so after doing the clinic with them early in the morning, we certainly didn't expect for them to pick it up within three hours and come out and kick our butts. I think, you know, so obviously some of the guys were um, not in the best of shape, I, I, me in particular, but, you know, I think, you know, again, basketball diplomacy, having that opportunity to teach those guys the game and play with them, really didn't like getting our butts kicked, but to have the opportunity to play with them, you know, it's a, it's a memory that I I'll, I'll always have. And, um... I'm sure you were treated like gods over there coming, uh, you know, into now. I know a lot of international players, like the fans over there are like ecstatic and everything. Like, how was the, the fan reaction to you guys being in the country? Well, it was different because we basically stayed at the hotel the entire time. I know I stayed in the hotel the entire time. We didn't really do a lot. I know in the documentary, I've watched it once. I know there were some of the scenes, scenes that I wasn't a part of, and I didn't go to the the, the uh, ski resort or wherever they went, but um, it was different, man. It was it was not so much that there was autograph signatures. There really wasn't a lot of time for that. Um, you know, again, we went over to teach them those young men the game over there, um, and it was it was eerie. After it was something different, something I've never experienced from a crowd, from a fans. You know, we really didn't have that much interaction with the fans, in particular, just the players and just the game. All right, speaking of teaching young men, um, this is great what you're doing here. Uh, do you have uh, any upcoming events planned or th there's nothing as of right now? And if, if so, th is there a Twitter or a social media website where people could stay involved on what you're doing next to help the kids? Yeah, I'm, right now I just enrolled my, my two boys in Old Saybrook High School, the high school that I went to. So I'm just going to focus the next month and a half on getting them set up academically and set up you know, for, for school this year. My son will be a junior, my other son will be a freshman. So I, I'm just going to dedicate the next month and a half. I'm not really a social media guy, so my, my, my kids are telling me I'm, that's telling my age that I'm not doing social media. But that's what I'm going to do for the next month is get them ready for school so that they can do their very best. I was a little old school too. I didn't do social media until I started going on TV. But, uh, but it's great what you're doing with the kids and it's great to see you out here and giving back to the community. Uh, hopefully we'll see some of your sons in the NBA and maybe they'll come on Real Fans Real Talk as well. But we do appreciate having you on the program and we appreciate what you do for the community. Uh, once again, NBA great. Vin Baker, Real Fans Real Talk, Mark the Statman Skevich, thank you for joining us, everyone. RealFansRealTalk.com, where Arthur Domus tripped young and intern Tom for the white and black fans, Asia to Manhattan. I get all my facts from my bro, Mark the Statsman. If you're not tuned in, I recommend the CAT scan. And if